name is Richard Miller. You're at Never Not Here. And I'm glad you could drop by. And for four years, four and a half years, I've got myself into opportunities to speak uh, with, I wouldn't say as many people as I could, but I don't really back off either. I, I could probably really go for it, knowing what an extremist I am. But, uh, and maybe someday I will, but I mean, I'm just trying to see, well, what's, what is really the outcome of, of a lot of verbalization? And uh, in a way, that's what we're all doing. Somehow our life is built of relationships. And uh, we could say it's more than just our speech, more than just our language. And of course it is. Uh, it's everything. Just because you're talking doesn't shut everything else down. And whatever the magic of, of life is, it's still what's animating us. And uh, I I'm, guess I'm just wondering if uh, we add some language and we talk about things and we try to explain our experiences, does that make any difference to another person? And uh, of course we all like a good story and it's a huge industry, storytelling industry is huge. And in some senses maybe it keeps us where we are and in some senses maybe it liberates us from where we think we are. And uh, language is used for all those purposes. So I guess I'm a philosophical guy because I like to try to figure out like well, what's going on here. Hmm. And uh, I could really get into it. So uh, before I get too down, far, down, far down the rat hole, I'll just say, hello, Pamela Wilson. Hello, and thanks hello. for coming over. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> it's good to be with you. Hmm. So mm. sometimes we've had some long distance connections, but one mm. time we were in one of those uh, TV studios even. I remember. Yeah, that was scary, huh? <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to do it, you know, so I was scared, <laughs> I guess, but uh, <sighs> it was kind of pretty mm. neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here we are. What should we be curious about? Mm. Mm. There's so many things that you know, we could go into, you know, because like a lot of people want to know, well, how did it, how did it all happen in the past, you know? Mm. And when you search your memory, uh, what were the the key points? What were the turning points? Mm. And uh, I, let me just list a few before we kind of sure. just jump into it. And so then, in a way, that's the story, right? Mm. All my turning points and how it happened to me and. Mm. And uh, I guess there's a, it seems like there's a lot of interest in that because when you listen to people speak, a lot of times they include a lot of that material. And then sometimes uh, people like me force them, <laughs> you know, and say, oh, tell me what happened, you know, tell me, tell me what, uh, yeah. how you got to, what were you like as a kid and all this stuff. But it's kind of sweet because everybody's life is a parable for what is, you know, so it doesn't, you know, everybody can speak of this and their intimate knowing of this and then the apparent forgetting and then the apparent remembering. And, but it does make for a really good story because it kind of invites everybody to notice that we're all the same. So Sometimes that works, but sometimes we think that uh, somebody's story is really exceptional and that mine could That's never true. add up to that. You know, it never could be that good. Mm. And I, you know, I suggest that the really uh, exceptional gurus and masters and the ones that have even hundreds of thousands of people following them, and because of that, they probably have a huge protocol around them. And, it, and even that kind of makes it feel like they're even more on a higher platform. Mm. And I would have to say that my sharing, especially from doing Never Not Here, is that I've, I've gotten way more out of what I call emerging teachers than I ever got out of the, the ones that were spot on, uh, mm. most popular, uh, commercially successful. Ah. Well, that's resonance for you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So and also, it's, I, like, I like having close contact, and it, that's a very specific role, a mass teacher, so to speak. And um, 
I've been lucky that with my messengers or teachers that they were small enough that I could hang out with them and, you know, then that helps drop the projections and the comparing function and the hierarchy and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely at- attracted to that too. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, I sometimes I make a go for a more popular teacher. Mm-hmm. And then I probably say, see, I told you it wouldn't work. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, They're all good. commercial over there. They want uh, the big bucks, you know. Uh, if I was Oprah, I could get them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's pretty mysterious because the nature of the identified mind is to protect preciousness. So, you know, that'll happen with a mass teacher. If there's a lot of devotion, then there'll be these sort of protective, you know, friends around them. And then... Let's just say that again, because that was really, uh, had a great great ring to it. The Mm. nature of the identified identified mind mind is to protect... Yeah. Would you call it it specialness or did you call it uh, uh, preciousness? Preciousness. Whatever it perceives to be precious, it'll move to defend it. So if it's an apparent teacher or the the great new baseball pitcher or, you know, the great, who knows, cellist, there'll be all of a sudden people that come around those people and try and keep them a little bit separate to be safe. It's just the nature of how the mind defends. Yeah. So we see it with the mass teachers. They're hard to get close to because there's very well-meaning friends going, oh, you can't touch them, and oh, you can't, you know. Right. Well, at a certain point, it makes sense because mm. it's like there's just too much, you know. Mm-hmm. It's just too much. I mean, he, the president is shaking everyone's hand. I don't, you know, not really. But, you know, <laughs> in a way, wouldn't, uh, I mean, I've heard people say, well, that's, the, mm, that's what uh, a cult is. In mm. other words, a cult is when you take something and you separate it. and. Mm. And build a wall around it and mm. say, and we're special. You know? mm. And then that a cult could be a baseball cult. We could just be talking about the Cubs or something nice, like that yeah. or anything else, or especially a religion or a spiritual figure, too. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not saying that's bad or good, but I mean, I'm just kind of defining that as like maybe. Yeah, it's also just a um, kind of, once again, the, the echo of functions in the mind when it doesn't know its true nature. Because doesn't that do it? Doesn't it do it? it to us as well you know it it thinks because we're openness that somehow we're frail and thus we need more vigilant services and all that sort of thing it's just a an unexamined habit i think right but i mean uh i i'm really for that i I mean i'm I'm totally on your wavelength i think you're talking about vulnerability and how people say that uh, I want to be vulnerable but there's pain there and Mm -hmm. and they just believe that pain and vulnerability are the same thing basically. Mm -hmm. That's nicely said, yeah. And they don't realize that vulnerability has an absolute strength in it. Mm. Right. Mm. Well, I mean, in a way, it it, it, it it reminds me of a willow tree or something that can bend in the wind, mm. right? But a vulnerability is even better than a willow tree because it's like transparent. <laughs> like, shoom, in one side, <laughs> out the other, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the wind goes right through it. Right. Yeah, nice. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. So then some people don't like stories, you know, both, uh, um, you know, stories have a bad rap sometimes, mm-hmm. although we're, no matter what we're saying, we're telling a story, but, you know, personal stories, let's say. And then so some teachers or, you know, some guests or some presenters or some people would just say, well, tell us what's practical. You know, mm-hmm. in other words, then we talk about uh, how I deal with individuals and uh, I'm always on an individual basis and mm-hmm. I don't have a dogma or a teaching. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, and then I can somehow uh, suggest... Uh, well, people are doing practices and stuff, and you know, and many times I could suggest that your life is your practice, and uh, you know, just get in sync with what's coming up now, and and so then you can talk about the practicality of uh, how I, since I'm a presenter of uh, of uh, let's call it freedom, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a presenter of freedom. How do, how does that actually activate? Where is that? Where, how does that freedom, uh, you know, how can you touch that in a, in a, in a more mm. succinct way? Or? Well, you know, that, that since as awareness we, we have a tendency to notice what's out here, so to speak, 
it rarely turns around inside and gets curious about itself or the substratum. Um, you know, that's what's so fun for me about what's called satsang is that, is that just a few words and an invitation like that just to look within and look behind the scenes, so to speak, and then people get it like right away. Because the training in, is always just to, to be gazing and noticing out here in the so-called world. You can say it's, it's easy for people to turn, turn it around once they get the idea of what it means, but I'll, I'll bet you, I'm just looking from my own experience, that uh, many people, like th maybe they think they got it, they, they know they don't have it, they mm. puzzle over it, mm. they think they got it, no, they don't, no, that ain't it. And they puzzle over it, and really, somehow, it's not all that clear. Mm. But that which is puzzling is, is probably what we call the mind, right? Yeah, because the mind has higher standards than just awareness or gazing has. The mind wants something. Um, it's been trained to look for forms and for something that's constant and measurable in form. And here it's invited to look for something that has no form. It's immeasurable. It's ever present, but it often likes to rest back in the unmanifest. So it, it sort of gave itself a great treasure hunt with very little clues. And in that sort of, you know, curiosity, it starts to notice that maybe the value is not, the ultimate value may not be in form because it was trained. Well, it's not really going to find a formless, right? Because it doesn't have, a, it doesn't really... Uh, identify things without form. Well, actually, the mind can notice. The mind can notice. Can notice absence, or well, what? Absolutely, it notices absence, doesn't it? And it notices. Gee, I don't know. It just checks in later and said, "What happened that last hour?" You know. <laughs> <laughs> but is that noticing? What is it? You know, it does that. It's not really noticing it, is it? Huh. I don't know. I think it notices more than we give it credit for, because some of the initial pointing out instructions are that the mind don't. Don't touch it. Don't worry about it. Let it just be itself. And I had this idea in the past um, that the mind actually couldn't realize its true nature, that it would be forever, so to speak, crystallized in that form that it wasn't happy with. So I was really surprised to find out that wasn't true. But you say it's true nature. Mm -hmm. So then does that mean true nature? Yeah. Or mind's true nature is true nature? Yeah. Okay, let's go into that one a little. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, so we notice, and the mind knows that it's intelligent, right? Yeah. Well, Obvious. you know, let's not go too fast. <laughs> oh, right. Here you have this bright, shiny, quicksilver intelligence. It's very evident in you. Yeah, and the mind can notice that about itself. Yeah. Let's say what it is a little bit. Let's just say like what the what the intelligent part is. Like I mean, there's things like memory, and there's things like pattern, pattern recognition, and there's things like uh, spatial uh, uh, orientation, mm -hmm. and, uh, and what. Let's but say those, a few I would things. Say those are kind of like the byproducts of the the keen intelligence that is mind. It has it. It pretty much is deeply aware and notices stuff. It exhausts itself through being vigilant. It doesn't need to do that. But but what I like showing... It also gets juice out of being vigilant, right? But you're I saying guess. it exhausts itself, too. Oh, well, maybe, yeah. I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> well, when you're young and excited about everything and oh, you feel I like see, you got yeah. a ton of energy and you're just going to go out and conquer the world forever and ever and ever, you know. And then <laughs> later you say, this is too long to be conquering the world. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, so it runs out of steam. Right. When you notice that it takes steam to do it. But just maybe the way we do it, because we do it with a lot of uh, waste, you know, mm -hmm. with a lot of anxiety and stuff mm -hmm. like that and a lot of force, you mm -hmm. know. And if we could just learn to do it with no force... Maybe then it's pure pleasure and pure uh, simplicity. Yeah, so if the mind knows it's intelligent and it's, it's curious, yeah. Now both those are formless. Yeah. Intelligence is formless, curiosity is formless. 
It's not like they're objects floating around. I have a curious object. No, no, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm well, like I want to go slow on intelligence, and I don't want to just jump on the boat of intelligence and say, of course, we got intelligence. No, <laughs> I just want to say, well, what is the, what are the parameters of it? What are the, uh, is does it have any qualities? And you said, okay, it has curiosity. It has, it has uh, keenness. Keenness, which mean means a very fo fo aware. can focus. Does it's keenness crisp. mean it can focus and change um, focus quickly, or what? Um, that word for me, focus, points to something it's been conditioned into. Um, that might be the way I'm using the word, because focus means to take something that's naturally like this and go. Now it'll do that through its natural interest. It'll almost like draw its its um, focus, I guess. Focus is your attention, right? That's how I use it. But that's what okay. you're saying. And then you you get you tie, you tied it to interest, and I and I think that's brilliant because mm. interest is what uh, determines our focus and yeah. why you and I have a different focus because we have different interests. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So that all of that is formless, like even focus is formless. So already, mind could notice that its nature is formless, and it's actually ever present. Even when it's resting, there's no loss of intelligence or curiosity or... Even when it's asleep? We're not so sure about all that, huh? Well, I mean... But I mean, the part of mind that runs the, the body, you know, the automatic, uh, autonomic nervous system yeah. and stuff is totally intelligent and totally working. Yeah. So we have lots of ideas, or I certainly had lots of ideas about the mind that weren't accurate upon deeper reflection or noticing, you know. Since we're exca excavating the foundations, I want to kind of go in a way, you know, and let's see, see if I can throw... I've never really stated this, but let me see if I can somehow put it out there. But we have this apparatus, right, which just kind of distinguishes hum humanity from other life forms. We think. Nice. You know, we're I'm not so sure, you really. Added that. Yeah, we think, or we mm -hmm. say, or it seems like it's so, so many orders of magnitude more, it seems like, anyhow. And so then this apparatus uh, has a kind of a way to take pictures in a photo album. And then that photo album is really good at uh, also having a lot of info with each photo, which means like there's labels and meanings and feelings and uh, decisions and all these things somehow, uh, and histories. So then we come up with these histories. So I was just thinking the other day, like mind is just uh, our device and what it's what it must do, what it's destined to do, what it was made to do, is to recognize patterns mm. or create patterns. Mm -hmm. You know, because maybe if I say recognize patterns, then, then we have to believe that the patterns are already there. They're already out there. And we know that in some sense we're recognizing a pattern because of what we're, how we saw it yesterday. You know, and there's, an interpretive, there's an interpretive bias there that's saying that, oh yeah, there's that pattern again. And so then patterns is like who I am. It's the pattern that keeps coming back at me is who I believe mm -hmm. I am. Hmm. And, uh, and where does it come from? Well, I mean, mind is vast, let's say. Whatever this True. mind thing is, we don't know really where the edges are, you know. <laughs> and then things bubble up. And so then it means, bubble up means like uh, we're not noticing and then we notice, right? And then we never really notice all the stuff that could bubble up until we do, right? Uh, and then that's kind of the focus of wide and narrow and all that stuff. But in the, in the, uh, in the, in the non-noticed mind, we just call it unconscious because it's not in our conscious, right? It's right. not really a place or it's not any different. It's all the same mind, but we're just not noticing it. So then what's some, there's some kind of driving force that's running our lives that we're not noticing. And it keeps coming up, and we think, God, that must be real, right? Mm. <laughs> but you know what I'm and, fascinated about is why what we call the mind likes um, structure and form and patterns. I'm just wondering if it likes that because its nature is formless and pattern and structure and all that is fascinating to it. And that's how it kind of adorns itself, because basically it's formless. So it puts those cl that clothing on to lend itself more uh, 
can't really say density, but more existence. Maybe. Yeah, more existence because I, you know, the what what comes to me is that mind can't, it can't really grasp things that don't have form or that don't have a label. Mm -hmm. A label is just a recognition of a boundary, right? Mm -hmm. And any kind of a boundary it can either be physical or it can just be conceptual. Mm -hmm. And then we can put a word to it. Mm -hmm. Every word is a, is a boundary, basically. It's mm -hmm. a nickname for a set of boundaries. I like that nickname. Yeah, <laughs> it's a <laughs> kind of a sound that can. <laughs> it's kind of a sound that can uh, get us into uh, recall a whole series of images and a whole. Uh, and without you know, I'm thinking that the primitive man or the or the animals have surely have images, but they don't have that many names with them, or they don't have that many. You know, okay, all these names are, are what I call abstract. Mm. And abstract to me just doesn't mean like modern painting, just lines and jagged things and that doesn't have any meaning. Abstract just means it's not here now. Mm. You know, it's not really in front of my face. Because like an animal, I think, only deals with what's in front of its face. Oh, like an amoeba. Yeah, amoeba we, just... we don't really know that, though. Yeah. Yeah, we'd have to interview yeah, we'd have Flash. to interview Flash. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, it's a proposal. It's a proposal, a work in progress, you know. It could be. Okay, let them do hearsay. it too, you know. I don't yeah. care, but maybe let them do it, you know. Uh, let them have abstractions, mm. you know. But they don't really usually get worried about their bank balance and stuff like that. Very smart. They don't even go there. They don't even have a bank balance. Right. They just say, my master is taking care of all that for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just need a little food and shelter, and that's good enough. Right, Some right. Friendship and love. Yeah. Well, like uh, the uh, Flash, the dog upstairs is laid back, and so he's not really counting the hours and saying, oh, I'm wasting my life just laying here. I could be out chasing mm -hmm. a bone or, yeah. or, or finding what, a rabbit or something. What's my purpose? Yeah, what's my purpose in life? Mm. Never gets into that. Now, that's all that abstract stuff, isn't it? Mm. Like those are the things that can come in with the, uh, uh, and the whole point is to uh, recognize a pattern is what I'm coming up with. Mm. And that the pattern idea is just that I can make some sense of this life, you know, and I can predict things because I, I, I have a history of how they used to go. And then this is just, a, in most cases, is I don't know, I just believe it's kind of forced. Yeah. In other words, we're forcing the same thing to happen again and again by, by building this... <sighs> this uh, conceptual pattern. But I'm just, I always like to get to the root, like, you know, what does that give the mind? And is it satisfied with whatever that service is giving it? Because I noticed that most, there's only one mind, but most of them, you know, are not deeply content and satisfied and like flash upstairs, Do you know? So I always like to ask the mind, what would satisfy you forever? Or what are you really seeking in all the structures and the figuring everything out, you know? And it's very honest, the mind, when you ask it these questions. So it's like we're giving satsang to the mind, yeah? Rather than waiting it for, waiting for it to unwind in apparent time and all that. Definitely patterns are, you know, you have to create time to have a pattern. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, you have to ha wait for some, you know, the whole unwinding scenario becomes possible. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, what does it give to the mind? To me, yeah. I would just say it gives uh, substance. Ah. Because without any uh, labels, uh, images just come and go. Mm -hmm. They just flow. Because now you're looking at a tree, now you're looking at a bird, now you're uh, walking down the street. Uh, and those images... I mean, if you were just, well, I don't know, I don't want to say pure presence or anything like that, but I mean, if you're just <laughs> not doing your mind trip and trying to fit it all in, uh, I don't think there would be any recall on any of that. Yeah, but I wonder if the mind receives that training in school. Do you know what I mean? If it was trained in school uh, to Boy, boy, that's create. a lot of training because it's it so, so good at it. Yeah. It's so good at it. I was going to just say that's its nature. No, because um, it's not, it's not, if it's its nature, then it's, it would be that way for all beings. But in certain cultures, supposedly, you know, their minds don't function like that. Yeah. So right behind any imprinting or conditioning or even habits, the mind is just pure, present, 
still intelligence. And so just like a muscle has found a certain habit, yeah, and it'll send signals that it doesn't like that habit anymore, and it sends signals to this awareness that we are, so to the mind in its restlessness or discontent or dissatisfaction is sort of sending signals to the resonant sage that we all are saying, hey, <laughs> hey, show me my true nature because this is getting a little bit much. So you say this hurts, huh? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, because how strange. A, in school, I mean, this could be just my experience, but I was taught to pull in the the open intelligence, to train it to really uh, make distinctions, compare, um, and then wisdom was uh, kind of purported that that was how you sifted through everything and compared and everything, and then you'd get to the heart of the matter, or, and, th and that wasn't really my experience. So. I notice that when I invite the mind to see its true nature, to relax open, all of a sudden there's this satisfaction, this ah, ah. And A, its, it's um, awareness is keener and it actually can kind of invoke whatever it needs to know from within itself, from within the stillness. And I think that's its deepest pleasure, is to know itself also as consciousness, to know it has ultimate value no matter what information it accumulates or whatever talents it has. And when it knows that, it's like, oh, I knew that. Yeah, that's what I've been looking for. Because the great promise is in Western culture is accumulate a lot of information, a lot of wisdom, and then your value will be increased. Yeah, okay. Uh, the Western culture says accumulate a lot of wisdom, and accumulate a lot of experiences. And stuff. <laughs> and accumulate a lot of stuff. And then you'll have But I mean, extra basically, value. that all comes from one thing. Mm. And that's what you could call a belief in incompleteness. Very true. It's like, I mean, I'm needy. And so then that's why I say the mind is, is its nature, is to uh, go out and categorize and search, because it's all based on the foundation of I'm needy. Right. And for that moment when you say, okay, well, for this minute I'm just an experiment, or otherwise just have an experience that's really, I use, lately I've been saying like when your grandson comes by or something, because when your son comes by, you're, you could be thrown into a lot of neediness about how am I going to raise this kid and how am I going to get him, I'm going to start a college fund for him right now and I'm, you know, but when your grandson comes by, you might just be blown away and say, wow, <laughs> this is, kid is cool. <laughs> and then you're not needy. Yeah. You know, and then your mind just goes to uh, something peaceful, right? I mean, it's just, and so then I'm saying that, uh, I guess I'm saying that the mind is not uh, the one that's satisfied. The mind is just a tool that uh, when you, when you call out neediness, the mind salutes and goes to work yeah you know and but then, i wonder where it came up with this identification with deficiency and this is just the result of the inquiry here is that it saw itself as formless and before language moves it has very few qualities that are in any fullness or any manifestation and then it goes to school and the projection is you really have to learn some stuff because then you can have value and you know you'll get respect and everything i don't know you and i ought to start a school for sure because you know <laughs> like then we're putting in a lot of stuff on this in the school but i mean the parents and you know, i mean we all believe that uh I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've seen it sometimes when people and their kids, and, and they're really ruthless to their kids, mm -hmm. but in a very nice way. But I mean, in, uh, they're totally uh, brainwashing them, right? And they're, they're totally convinced that they're doing the very best to get them ready even sooner. Absolutely. You know, they're, they're they want, be, well, it's coming they're from be advanced. wide love. Yeah. Yeah. It's total love. Yeah. In the meantime, mm. yeah. But what if the mind could know its absolute unshakable value just as it is right now, and that nothing could enhance 
that. Then it, it then it can rest. I suppose I have a, a definition that the mind is just a tool and it's just a being that's yeah, gonna know it. Yeah, but a tool it, is it, an object. Yeah. But see, this is how also um, humanity treats nature something to be used like you know sometimes I drive through the wilderness and you get these big signs and, and it says land of many uses because before just fallow wilderness you know people no didn't use, really right? honor it oh, yeah. like, well we can't um, run cattle here or whatever right and now now so it has to sort of make a statement okay this even though it's natural and it hasn't been touched. It still has value. Many uses, right? I yeah. mean, we even say that we project that on the Amazon that the green reserve of, of the planet Earth is making oxygen for us and it has a use, right? Yeah. So, but that's the only way they could like get to folks. Get that, humans to back off. That's of it. Right? <laughs> Trust Let's me. Let's stay you with need this now. This. Exactly what did you say? Land of many uses. It blew me away when you said that. But I mean, this is just our ideas. Everything for is is for us. That's it. And it's 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 sovereignty and it's hierarchy and it's it's <clears throat> actually arrogant in in a old fashioned way. You know, it's like from the wilderness's point of view, if the wilderness could notice and it probably does because it's the same supreme intelligence the human tribe the wilderness would go whoa whoa but they don't have a bible see if the bible was written for the wilderness and it said you have dominance over mankind <laughs> the bible says you're we taller got, we got dominance over the wilderness right <laughs> yeah but it's just so funny it's like this a real confusion about value Real confusion about so the and even the wilderness doesn't have dominance. It's just symbiosis. Yeah, there's in in absolute unity. There's nothing higher or lower. Every termite has the equal value of a, a tractor or a cello or a you know. That's pretty amazing to notice that. <laughs> As we stomp around, go, oops, sorry. <laughs> I, it's so great. I was driving down um, Fifth Avenue, I guess, in New York, and I was in a cab. I love cabs because, you know, you're in the back and you, you can just be spacious and just notice and you get great people watching in New York, right? And I was noticing that the gaze was uh, being drawn to certain people on the street and there were so many different kinds of people and um, there was a noticing of that and uh, you know you know a really old lady or you know an apparent bum or you know some really beautiful person and some skipping children and a lot of the the friends that were walking by it wasn't interested in apparently or wasn't being drawn by and all of a sudden stillness said to me everyone is equal value and it was so interesting because it started to relax all these um, very very subtle hierarchies of value you know like based on appearance or function or energy levels or whatever and it was such a beautiful choice for it to reveal that absolute truth what a perfect place new york where i mean there was hundreds of people and from every single different expression and age and it was it was one of the great moments of my life because i, I went wow everyone is equal value because it just dropped so many uh, beliefs in that moment, you know, it was just oh, a great moment. <laughs> I've kind of resisted the internet, you know, and, and mm. uh, uh, in one sense, in one sense I've adopted it and really mm. kind of maybe even a, in my own little way some kind of a leader. But I've kind of resisted instant news and things like that, mm. and say, and I used to tell myself that uh, pain is everywhere in the earth, 
and if that's what makes floats your boat, you can have as much as you want. Mm. And I'm I'm a, I can resonate very well with pain. I mean, I, I I'm not really cut off, and so I do way better not to look at it. Mm. In that sense, unless I can be, maybe I don't know why I'm so deeply moved. You know, I mean, maybe it's some kind of a a resistance to it. No, uh, it's that, that the it, nature of who you are uh, is deeply moved. In other words, I can say that, oh, just to g- give an example, I can't even watch movies. Because mm. every movie's got some kind of a violent thing in there, mm-hmm. and some kind of useless thing in there. And I, I just as soon throw a rock through the TV set or the uh, <laughs> stomp out of the movie house. Yeah. Then just say, invite that in, you know, because it's, I just feel like it's an, un- you know, it's just what I'm saying, because somehow uh, that's the, I build up a, I build up a justification to uh, how I storied the whole thing. Mm. But it's your nature as um, as compassion and as love to be that touched. And it's actually why there's so many movements to not be present or invitations by the conditioning or the defenses because we are so deeply touched. So the conditioning tries to defend its naturalness from being devastated. Right. I mean, it's just like what I was saying before, so self-confidently about uh, vulnerability and mm-hmm. is tied to pain. And here I am and, uh, tying uh, this, uh, you know, viewing world pain as, mm. as, as uh, also hurtful to me. And so then I realized something too, really big, just uh, maybe just yesterday or, you know, really just a short time ago. And I realized that I had this whole set of beliefs that around... Uh, well, basically, I've adopted karma and destiny mm. as a, a way to, to ensure my separateness. Mm. Because uh, if I have a, you know, if there's no pain in my life, I could say, well, that's my good karma. I don't have any pain, and then I want to keep it that way. So then I would cut out anything uh, that wasn't uh. that was painful, mm-hmm. right? And then I would never see that uh, maybe that energy could be even. Uh, what should I call it? Uh, that 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 energy that seems to want to come up and be shock and and maybe even outrage if it's some somebody doing something to somebody. But if it's just a natural thing, it would still be a very huge sadness. But somehow yeah. that energy comes up, and that energy probably could be useful. You know, maybe it could be turned and like, hey, I could even mm. help those people. You know, and but. Do it somehow not out of anxiety and somehow do it not out of uh, guilt Mm -hmm. and not out of, uh, uh, you know, outrage or revenge or all the things that don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, it would be fresh then. I realized how I storied storied all those things like destiny and I used them to uh, maintain separateness Mm -hmm. and and protect myself. Yeah, it's strange stuff all this, huh? You know, I get to a point where you start to see that every story you tell somehow is ser- serving you some way to keep you stuck, to keep me, you know, and it just explains uh, uh, my behavior in a mm-hmm. way that says that's good behavior, keep doing it. And in a way, each one of those interpretations, my worldview somehow uh, puts my lifestyle on a pedestal and says, you know, and actually uh, builds walls around it. and and makes a fortress out of it by these words. Yeah, it's curious, isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's all very self-serving. Yeah, but it's also impersonal functioning. It doesn't refer to you. It's just these strange coping strategies that the mind came up with for shepherding or herding or protecting this precious naturalness. Yeah. So... I think I notice that when I thank those functions, they just rest. Thank? Thank. Uh, thank. Oh, I thank them, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> See, I've heard you thank some functions before. <laughs> I hadn't yeah. thought of thanking that one. But, you know, I don't feel too guilty about it or anything like that. And I, and uh, impersonalization is something that really makes total sense to yeah. me. You know, total sense, you know. 
And then I love uh, just to, to, to be telling this to you. And then I'm telling it to you when I'm yeah. putting it on this table over yeah. here. And then everybody could say, well, karma, what do you mean? Karma's real, you know? I but mean, that's what's I do so have beautiful. good karma, you know? And then, yeah, but, you know, we, we want to liberate all that stuff, so to speak. Um, maybe liberate isn't the right word, but to look deeply into its true nature. And you're, you're noticing that destiny and karma are ideas um, that actually have a lot of group agreement that are keeping them afloat. But really, it's, it's building the whole structure really of haves true. and have nots. Yeah, it's doing. I mean, it, you know, it's really doing everything in the world that we're saying we're uh, mm -hmm. we're shocked at, and uh, we're doing it in one hundred percent full steam on. Mm. Mm. Oh, even karma is exhausted. <laughs> Rather than having to keep track of all these, we don't even need these. it. You know, it's no. just another pattern. Yeah, that that mind just figured out so that it's it just could, another for what idea. you know because it was not complete, right? Mm. I'm needy, so I need the pattern of karma, mm. and that'll just keep me fixed in my, uh, in, in my case, uh, semi-rich lifestyle, and somebody else's case, a semi-poor lifestyle. Mm. Well, here we are back to the only reason all that needs to be added or assumed it's needed to be added into the openness is because it has no form. So there's like, it's almost an embarrassment. You know, sometimes I imagine, of course, this is imagination, which is also formless. But I have this fun imagining that one day when the mind crystallized enough, it looked down within the body, so to speak, and went, oh no, there's nothing there. How am I going to work with this? How am I going to turn it into a productive member of society? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So There's like, nothing there. Oh. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I'm going to have to give it likes, dislikes. Okay, you like broccoli. Oh, you like potatoes. Ooh, you do not like those things. Anchovies. Ooh, no. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, there is a character that arises out of this open no thing starts with likes dislikes good bad and and then but it needs this is so funny it's like a script supervisor it needs constant repetition because the apparent actor keeps going fast and empty <laughs> forgetting their lines well, how was i supposed to react here <laughs> oh, i'm supposed to get really upset <laughs> so it's it's kind of really funny you know from the view here and also i can see the nobility in all of it and actually the intelligence but mostly the, the, the tragic repercussions and also the humor of it. Because it really did allow me, because I thought I was someone, then I could really experience the full Shakespeare. But if, you know, if I'm a teenager and not thinking I'm Pamela and not having this idea, well, I don't have a boyfriend and that means this and that. You know, without, without my script supervisor, I wouldn't have had so many, like, deep, heartful, devastating moments, you know. So that was good. We must have wanted a lot of really Shakespeare. Well, let's look in the present. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of people that are just that age right now, and they're mm -hmm. just, and they're looking down and they're saying, gee, <gasps> What am I going to do with all this space? <laughs> you know, and yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, I don't know. Do they have to go through the whole deal of filling it up and then emptying uh, it out I later, know. or I mean, how can mm -hmm. they feel confident that this space well could be whatever know, it can be? Yeah, you know? that's a beautiful invitation because we, you know, that's what's so lovely about having most of the experiences one can have is that you can report back and go, "Hey, that doesn't add anything." to your, um, your clarity, it doesn't add any wisdom. It adds street smarts, that's for sure. But it really doesn't enhance your being going through all of that oh, ups and downs. and Because that's the great myth in humanness, is like if you live life to the fullest, you'll know your majesty and your dignity and your, you'll really be big and bold if you really go for it, right? Instead of like, you can sit on the bench and know you're 
majesty and your dignity and your like innate value. You know, you don't have to go like, okay. And yet there sometimes is an impulse and a longing to live large or to live kind of discreetly and quietly and that's also resonance, yeah. So, what to do? I was a certain kind of a guy, you know. So, okay, I had three siblings, so the four of us. Two moved out and two stayed home. And uh, so then I wonder if I had stayed home, I wouldn't have really, be, I wouldn't have, I don't, I, if, I, if I project it to what, what that would be like, mm. you know, I would say I would always have some kind of a thorn in my side saying, should have gone, but you didn't. Mm. Should have gone, but you didn't. Mm. Of course, I went out and I did a million things, and they were all, like you say, you didn't need them, mm -hmm. right? They didn't add anything. But I mean, somehow but that what was they your added, resonance, what huh? they added, they added. I mean, they subtracted. They subtracted that thorn in my side that mm. was a belief that somebody, mm -hmm. you know, that people had planted into me that you could have a rich and marvelous life by travel the world and. Uh, mm -hmm. and work in lots of fields and you know make a certain amount of money enough and. Uh, and then that thorn would still be, you know, it would always someone could wiggle that thorn, mm. and, and, uh, and it, I would still feel the hurt of it. Yeah, you know? but that maybe that original thorn is is somehow I'm not okay, just being myself, and if that means you know being the world traveler, or being you know really quiet retreatant kind of naturally. Um, that thorn basically is a misunderstanding. It's a really original misunderstanding. You know, not honoring yourself, your own uniqueness, and that sort of thing. Some idea of deficiency. We're back at our friend. Well, I'm the prodigal deficiency. son, you know. Even the Bible has the, the whole story. is right there, right? <laughs> so, like, I mean, how does the big brother feel? He probably feels like hell because, like, the younger guy uh, took a lot of money and spent it and did all those great things mm -hmm. that's purported to be great. And then the dad said, "Hey, you're you're still my son." Mm -hmm. And then, but I did this. I sacrificed. And did he sacrifice or not? And we're mm -hmm. saying he didn't sacrifice. Mm -hmm. You didn't sacrifice. You know, mm -hmm. you stay-at-homes didn't sacrifice. Yeah. You know, and that's what but, we're saying loud and clear. But I mean, uh, <laughs> don't believe me. I'm the wrong guy to tell you. <laughs> But maybe everybody is the prodigal son. Daughter. daughter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and see, doing this is so highly valued in our culture, and it's gorgeous. It's a creative expression, and yet it doesn't add any value to being. It doesn't matter if you're a gardener or if you're the, you know, pick up the dustbins or if you're a bridge engineer or if you knit. Value is not enhanced or lost so that's one of them another misunderstanding in our culture right you are what you do i think we have to go deeper because like we don't even know what value is you know i mean uh, we have to say well nice. what is value because yeah what is value uh you know we might think value uh, a lot of times we say money measures value so then of course that's false but i mean but but i mean yeah. it's it's held i'm wondering if maybe value is also that which doesn't come or go Essence. Essence is oh, value. Essence, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's it. I mean, how could you enhance that? Yeah, shine it up. Oh, yeah. Okay, but you know, the tendency is to say it doesn't come or go, so screw it. <laughs> It'll be there when I get back. <laughs> like it's in the bag, right? You know, so whatever's in the bag, you know, then we go, the mind is, is loves to bag trophies and then go for another one. You know, I got these, why should I stop here? And so then that's a whole other way of looking at it. Yeah, but if it, if it brings natural pleasure and enjoyment, that's totally okay. But if it's bringing suffering, then there's a clue mm. that that isn't the resonance for that embodiment. For some embodiments, that's their resonance, and there's a lot of joy moves through. What? Because well, I kind of went on a th tack there, and I kind of like uh, spaced out a little bit. Well, meaning you said that... Um, you said that the mind likes to go bag more trophies. Now, for some people, it's a natural resonance. To bag more trophies? Yeah, and there's a joy and deep rest, and it's just their affinity. And somebody else who's mimicking that or thinks they should be like that and suffers, then the clue is in the suffering that that's not their natural resonance. It's sort of like when you play music. 
the, the strings will tell you if it's if it's a natural note and they'll if there's effort or if there's yeah yeah I get that but I mean yeah. I feel to say that um, okay uh, somehow um, bagging trophies is all about objects in mm. essence we have to uh, we said maybe essence now I use the word essence but you said I like that okay but we were talking about what's the value of life and, and then we got to make sure we're saying we can be real clear that essence is not an object and it can't go in any kind of a bag, you know. That's good news. And yeah, yeah right. And so then it's uh, <laughs> it can't be gained or lost. Yeah. Yeah. So then uh, that part is kind of a little tricky because when you say it can't be lost, then people say, "Well, let's see. I'll just go out and bag a few more." <laughs> but, see, but I that's didn't okay. bag the essence, huh? Yeah, that's it, okay. But I got time. I got uh, infinite time because what can't be lost, I don't have to mess with. <laughs> 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. So we're just we're just really playing with noticing, really, because as far as I can tell, wisdom is just noticing what is, and there's a lot of what is to notice, and that, that's why it's fun because you, you're going to notice some things that I haven't noticed yet, and vice versa. And well, when you say notice what is, I mean what is is the the non-objects, and the non-objects is essence. So the only thing we can do with the, uh, essence is notice it. Right. Uh, often. But Hopefully also often, this, right? this is, has form and essence. And I know you know that. They're not two, right? So what's kind of fun is there's a natural savoring also of form. Yeah. And knowing it's also formless. To me, that is really fun. I love knowing that nothing is what it appears to be. And occasionally I'm convinced by an appearance you know, in other words, everything is essence to Right, you. yeah. Every last thing is essence. And yeah, it, that's and it. And part of your focus sees Next that. interview will be with the plant. And you, could, <laughs> you could, like, hook it up to all these, like, things and then ask it questions. So how do you view humans? It's going, what's humans? <laughs> how are you feeling? Ever the same, it says. Though I could use a little water. Want a little water? No, it's good. Because I think it's good. I think it's good. <laughs> I mean, that's me. I mean, I'm like, I love peeking behind form and function because it's just, or into its heart. I'm so amazed by that. So amazed. People claim they can measure some things that are very, 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 very subtle. Mm. They probably can. And so then we're even, you know, we, maybe we're, when we're getting into a realm where talking to plants is, is is actually a possibility. I mean, just like when you do muscle testing, you know, yeah. with yourself, or with like this, and, mm -hmm. and you talk to yourself, or you're kind of talking to your body or your essence because yeah. what's doing the muscle testing. So then you same, can, same, yeah. you probably could, uh, you know, uh, talk to plants and a and ask them questions. You know, you could ask them uh, like a sage, if you had the address of of uh, where they're sending their messages. <laughs> that would be really great. If we could say, hey, do you guys know, actually they already do. I was about to ask them, do you guys know a way to um, uh, do alchemy with pollution? And actually these guys are experts on that. They're the number one doer. They're the yeah. number one alchemists. Pollution yeah. alchemists. Pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So then it's not pollution. To them, it's great food. That's right. Gray water. <laughs> Yum. <laughs> <laughs> well, we Give me more of that. dessert. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are weird. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Sorry, that was rude. Oh. <laughs> <You're> silly. <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> you know, there is a uh, purportedly, and I guess a lot of people agree and uh -huh. believe in it, there is a whole huge wide field called paranormal. And then there's some kind of knowing or uh, uh, communication mm. that we don't know how it really works by, by at least our science, but those that are in the paranormal know exactly how mm. it works. They're doing it all the time. Uh huh. Huh. Right? And so, well, you know, yeah. this is kind of like those things like Rupert Sheldrake when he talks about the morphic field. So, whatever this morphic field is, it's as I get it, it's not a physical field. 
but yet we're all in it. Yeah. Yep. We are all it. We are it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's pretty wild stuff, all of this. But I like it, yeah. I mean, I don't know much about science or detail stuff, but um, I heard that there is a function in the brain that graciously limits perception of what is to that which could be so-called handleable. And if that function in the brain that limits perception would stop limiting perception because of the absolute infinity of all there is, that would be a pretty amazing instant download that might fry the system. <laughs> so I love how these beautiful balancing functions are right are in yeah we don't even have to believe it or it doesn't even have to be true but the idea yeah. that um uh, some kind of a needle valve or some kind of a regulator uh it's and it's kind of typical in all kind of machinery too yeah is a good thing it's a good thing yeah yeah and then so then whatever the regulator lets through then that's what's right for us mm -hmm. at this moment mm -hmm. yeah it's all very gracious right mm -hmm. mm. Somehow in spirituality, we get the idea that there's some pure state and that it would somehow be better to be there. Mm. But we've just said, by the fact that exactly what you said, is that uh, the vastness is, uh, is a frying experience, you know, <laughs> for a limited pan, oh. a little frying, limited fry pan, and it can't take the vastness. So then, well, I, I, thank God there's a needle valve, and the needle yeah. valve may be called our language, you know, mm. and our kind of abstracted... Uh, interpretation of everything or the senses yeah well it's it's fascinating all of this stuff I love it but well, are we really a little frying pan <laughs> no but to say <laughs> that thing just says that I mean uh, you know you're not uh, in one way it says you're not incomplete mm -hmm. and that the uh, and that every time or every uh, appearance of being incomplete mm. is right for you. Mm. And so then that's, you can just be happy with that. Right. Be very happy nice. with that, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, the, the intelligence, it's, it knows itself so intimately in all of its embodiments. Yeah. It's very wise. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Wide ranging conversation. <laughs> I'm just crazy, I guess. I don't know why I say all these things or why I want to go in all these directions, and I'm, I really don't think they're all that helpful. Well, but there's also within you, you just have a natural joy and interest. Yeah. And who would want to like limit or contain that, you know? Like telling a fountain, quit splashing, quit. <laughs> <laughs> I like asking the stillness stuff because I'm I'm actually kind of lazy. Tell me the stillness stuff. Well, I, I just ask stillness whatever I'm curious about. And I don't have to ferret it out on my own. And if I'm in satsang, I ask everybody else what they're noticing. <laughs> I'm getting really lazy in my but so what are you noticing? <laughs> it's fun. Because we're all so unique and we're all drawn to certain things and I find. Hmm. Noticing uniquely. Yeah, I mean I think I'm doing the same thing, but I'm not doing it formally. Hmm. I'm not saying and 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 the only time anything good comes is out of like a like a um a halt point or like mm. a point where like it screeches to a halt mm. and that goes nowhere and then boing something mm -hmm. pops out mm -hmm. so in a way i think i i i, I feel like i understand what you're saying mm -hmm. there mm. it's always a circle each one of us like benefits and blesses each other just by what we've noticed and what we share even if it's not spoken, it's still downloaded, so to speak. That's even. 
simpler. Somehow with me, it, it kind of boils down to what I would call an anxiety level. Mm. And then anxiety is just a way to watch uh, maybe wholeness or incompleteness. Mm. And then uh, many times it seems to be attached to a belief structure or mm. a story. Mm. And uh, I think you can monitor that and it becomes real obvious. And uh, I used to think that stress was no big deal, and now I think it's like everything. Mm. Uh, mm. It's really, you know, it's kind of like what allows stillness, the absence of stress, mm. and allows peace, and it, uh, it disallows, or it keeps busyness going, and mm. keeps conflict Mm-hmm. going and it keeps separation going the anxiety part yeah and well tension then, is it's so beautiful in the word pretense for there to be pretense and projection of other there has to be tension you know so that's why most actually spiritual practices from all the ancient traditions are all about returning the body to a state of relaxation yeah because then in in that naturalness there is a just an effortless noticing of what is so all the you know the whirling dervishes and all the you know 10,000 prostrations and all the um, chanting for hours into the night it, it all just brings everything back to just like a deep unmoving exhaustion slash relaxation so it's all pretty sneaky all that stuff as it dissolves the tension in the body. And then it's so evident, all is well. (laughs) There's no problem. Yeah, everything's made of actually, even tension to me is remarkable because it has a huge strength in it. And huge strength points to that it has to be being fed by deep relaxation. So here's a circle of the appearance and what's really true so it's fascinating i'm just a junior detective i like <laughs> yeah i like that i like to be a junior detective it's too. fun but it's really i mean fun. Uh, how about this let's let's reverse it okay. let's just say that um there's the lar- one of the largest communities on earth well you know i mean in a way is um 80 billion cells Mm-hmm. And lately, I've been calling him Richard. Okay. And so then, uh, these guys work in harmony pretty good. It's a pretty good community. Mm-hmm. It's doing the best it can. Mm-hmm. But the the one limitation they have is they only have one radio station. Mm-hmm. And that radio station is always saying, Doom! Doom! You can't get it! We're not good enough! Ah! You know? <laughs> what are you doing in front of me? Get away from me! You know? And that radio station keeps blaring that, like, you know, 24-7, uh, now going on 68 years. And uh, if you could just tune in another channel, uh, all, all that relaxation would be happening without any prostrations. That's so true. Without any whirling. Yeah. So where is it getting its juice? Because that was very passionate expression of doom <laughs> and watch out. And I mean, where is it getting its juice? Invite it to... to to track itself back because it looks out here for safety and security rather than returning to its naturalness. It's never going to find safety and security out here, the constancy, the felt sense of that. Yeah, But within itself, it can. So I just invite, that's your last devotee inside that hasn't gotten it, so to speak. Mm. So just invite it to look. Who are you? Wow, you got big, big. I mean, it has big mojo. It has big juice. Maybe safety isn't its deepest longing. Well, you know, and there's well, there's so many things that we already talked about that are. Uh, it's kind of built on a web. It's it's held up on a web, okay, uh, probably of separation. 
you mm-hmm. know. And like I was just sharing that um, I was adopt, I was wholeheartedly adopting. You know, I didn't wasn't too much in karma and mm-hmm. and uh, you know and uh, destiny as far as thinking that I couldn't make any changes and I wasn't thinking of karma as like a reward or punishment system. But somehow I didn't even care what it was. It was just supporting my separation. Yeah. And saying that I was a, I had good karma, so why bother? Okay. And but everyone else, you know. So then that's part of the web that really just keeps me uh, keeps okay. me uh, looking out for number one because I think I believe there is a number one. But from there's that. there's actually no web, and there's just like maybe four misunderstandings, and there's no time involved. It's really not a big I, big deal. All this. So there's a misunderstanding that separation enhances its, its safety. Now, there's beautiful truth hidden within that misunderstanding. So just thank separation for keeping you safe all these years. If you interview it, it just says, I want to give you space, man. I want to give you space. You want to give you a buffer, right? No, I want to give you some space. Now, who it's giving space to is spaceless space. So when it sees that and you see that, it's it's actually darling. So then you say, well, I am space, so I don't need any space. That's right. I mean, you can't get more spacious than you are. And you certainly don't need a um, contracted function offering you space by pushing so-called others away. Yeah? So okay, it, that's one misunderstanding. That's yeah. a beauty. Okay, so here. Next. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to say four. I didn't invent the four part. You know? <laughs> so you had to go, oh. <laughs> so here, the, the other thing is that uh, a misunderstanding about the embodiment called Richard or the embodiment called Pamela. The dossiers were written under stress, so to speak. The dossiers were um, uh, recorded in moments of stress or pressure. They're not written in like, you know, Richard, when he's deeply relaxed and he's gardening, he just... Uh, the man is pure spaceless space. There's nothing in the dossier about that. Yeah. So the whole history, the personal history of a Pamela or a Richard, already is a biased, um, stressed misrepresentation of what is. So we can also thank that. That's a real that's really a great uh, realization because there's just no history writer and when everything is fine. That's right? a good point. There's nobody going, "Wow, that you just made the best tea." That was we're going to add that to your file. Great tea. Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's usually the recording replaying think, function goes into gear under pressure. Yeah, and I would just deny it anyhow, you know, like that part <laughs> of me that the historian would deny, it. "Oh, that, that tea nothing," you yeah. know. <laughs> no big deal. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So, you know, that whole mechanism of identification, you know, it's it's not an error in consciousness. It was to gift the unique embodiments with the fullness of experience. And it's gifted us that. So we can thank it. And then that, that file just relaxes back into its nature, which is the same spaceless space which has no history. Because history, I mean, it's actually a law of nature. History would have to arise and be born from something that has no history. Yeah, I mean, it, it would just be how it works. Well, I mean, history is the pattern that I was saying that we just made up, right? And then somehow we made it up based yeah. on the way we look at things, the way we interpret things, and the way we interpreted things yesterday, or the way our family... Yeah logic has done it or the way our culture does it or somehow our base agreements which are basically spring out of our language yeah. system but it doesn't have any existence correct it's formless yeah so then you can just kind of tickle anything that has apparent stress or form and it just goes like the gig is up like because you're right you're right i have no form i don't really same presence. No, I like that a lot. No, I mean, yeah. uh, 
I seem to be able to do that anyhow, whether I'm tickling it or just somehow being more harsh and dismissing mm -hmm. it, you know, mm -hmm. saying, get lost, mm -hmm. you bum. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here we have, if we don't access thought, memory, or sensation, we have no history. Yeah. And if we don't use the body as evidence of Richard or Pamela, then we really can't find an individual separate from the all. This allows us that experience and then also returns back to just being same formless, intelligent presence. Yeah. So we, we actually, that's such a blessing. We get to have it all. We get to have the full object, apparent history, personal thing. And then we get to have the full <gasps> mm, return. Oh, it's a big party. <laughs> Did we say four things? Or <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> you can't remember? I don't know. I think they were. I can't remember. The, 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 did we say two or three? I don't know. We hit separation, the whole personal thingy. Hmm. Hmm. I can't remember. That's the only problem with any sort of structure. They all dissolve, even lists. <laughs> Everything returns back to zero. Mm. Mm. <laughs> this is fun, Richard. Thank it really you. is. It really thank is you, fun. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. Uh. Mm. <laughs> 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 oh. mm. Good, good, good. So until next timelessness, how's that? <laughs> until next timelessness, right? <laughs> good, good. Well, you heard it, everybody. I mean, uh, what did you think of that? Uh, every <laughs> once in a while, we get some good traffic down here, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just keep a watching, and uh, we'll keep uh, coming up with something that'll astound you. <laughs> so thanks for being here, yeah. and uh, thank you. Pamela. Mm, thank you.